Okay, paradox of fire. Well, what is that paradox? We'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit, of course. Um, want to start off by showing some landscapes, um, getting you to remember what the continent used to look like. And for some reason, there we go. Ages ago, the continent was covered with a huge amount of forest, but there was probably even larger amounts of open habitat. Now, to some, this may look like forest, but technically to an ecologist, this is a savanna or a woodland. In other words, it's an area where with tree cover, but it, the tree cover is probably less than 50%. It's nice and open. Uh, this is a Western uh, forest, uh, ponderosa pine, uh, I believe in Oregon. Way over in the other corner of the lower 48 in the Southeast, we have lots of pine savanna, this being uh, slash pine savanna, but also we have longleaf pine savanna. And we had savannas that were so open in Northern Florida that they provided space for myriad wildflowers, including carnivorous plants, such as these beautiful pitcher plants shown here. If we go to the center of the country, to the Midwest, we had vast acreages of prairie that were very, very open, no trees, loaded with wildflowers, loaded with pollinators. Further south, uh, in my state, Oklahoma, we also had prairie, uh, maybe not quite as tall as the prairie in Iowa, but uh, beautiful nonetheless, very open, full of wildflowers. Uh, uh, obviously, these photos were taken fairly recently, so, so these ecosystems still exist, but there used to be vast, vastly more of these open grasslands, savannas, and woodlands, and they provided an immense amount of habitat for pollinators in North America. What was the main thing that kept those habitats open? For, for millions of years, it was lightning. Uh, lightning and the fires that lightning generated, sweeping across the landscape, killing woody plants. Uh, in some places, just, just top killing them, and then the plants would re-sprout. In other, in other cases, it would actually uh, kill those species down to the root. So fire caused by lightning was an essential process in our environment. Tens of thousands of years ago, people began adding fire to the landscape. Uh, and this is a fairly famous painting by Frederick Remington um, depicting uh, Native Americans in the central US lighting fires. I took a wonderful fire course at the University of Oklahoma taught by Professor John Weir, who was quite the expert on fire. He wrote a whole book on it. And later on, I'll show you the cover of the book. He pointed out to us that Native Americans had more than 70 reasons to burn the land. One of them, to protect themselves by, by or at least to help, them, to help them win battles by sending smoke into the faces of advancing armies. Another reason to burn, one of the 70, to increase abundance of edible plants. Another was to drive bison towards hunting parties. Another was to improve the habitat for game animals like bison. Uh, and this is a shot from Oklahoma showing a recently burned area. And what do you know, that's where the bison herd was that day that I was at this amazing 40,000 acre preserve in Oklahoma, which everyone should visit if they, if they, if they can get to this part of the country. It's, it's fantastic. The new grass that comes up after a fire is extremely nutritious and that attracts grazing animals like bison. So why should we burn today? I do need to move my, I'm going to try to move my Zoom menu. There we go. It was blocking my time. So why should we burn today? For many of the same reasons that the Native Americans burned and for some new ones. Benefits of prescribed burning are they help, fires help our grasslands stay grasslands. They help our ponderosa pine savannas and our longleaf pine savannas of the southeast stay savannas. Of course, gr they stay, the grasslands stay grasslands by the killing of woody vegetation. Um, 
pine savannas, stay savannas by opening up, by killing some of the younger trees and opening up the landscape. Also, the fire removes excess litter that can shade out young wildflowers. Fire increases blooming of many wildflower species. I'd say the majority of native wildflower species in fire prone habitats are benefited by fire. And fire increases the amount of bare ground for germination of wildflower seeds. In my neck of the woods, there's a very clear example of why we need to burn. We have a massive invasion of Eastern red cedar. And th that's the tree that you see here. This photo was taken on our farm uh, the year we moved in. Eastern red cedar is native, but 500 years ago, even 300 years ago, there were many, many, many fewer of them in the central US because fire, this tree cannot tolerate fire. And the fires generated by lightning and started by Native Americans killed these trees and wiped them off most of the landscape and kept our grasslands grasslands. I want to show you what it looks like underneath cedar trees. That cedar forest that I just took a picture of down at the ground level, that's what you see. You see shade, you see dirt, and very little else. Almost no other plants blooming, uh, present. Uh, very few grasses, few flowers, not much of anything except dirt and cedar needles. So basically, eastern red cedar is multiplying to such a great extent over huge parts, portions of Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, South Dakota, that it's become a green menace. Uh, it's an area with very little plant diversity. And by the way, when it doesn't have wildflowers, of course, it's not gonna have food for our pollinators. So uh, this is an example. Uh, the same thing gets repeated in other parts of the country. In the Southeast, you have species that are taking over like turkey oak. Due, due to the lack of fire, turkey oak is multiplying. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, I suspect there are other species doing, doing the same. Back to my neck of the woods. What you're seeing here is a ranch in Southern Oklahoma that used to be covered with cedar trees. They burned down the cedar trees and now the landscape looks like this. Phenomenal habitat for pollinators, especially monarch butterflies. Another reason to burn, to improve forage for cattle. Just like Native Americans burned to improve forage for bison hundreds of years ago, our ranchers today can burn to improve forage for cattle. Another very, very important reason for prescribed burning is to re reduce the amount of fuel around structures. On the left, you see a house surrounded by a lot of fuel. If there's a wildfire, this house will likely get burned down. On the other hand, the photo on the right, things are opened up a little bit. I would open up even, even more. I'd feel more comfortable if more of those trees were removed, um, either using prescribed burning or probably even safer mechanical control. So the big take home message about the importance of prescribed fire is that we need more of it in North America. We need more prescribed fire and more use of other means of fuel reduction so that we can make our homes safer uh, make our properties safer from the danger of wildfires. Prescribed fire really works. There is risk to it, of course. And people have died in, people who have lit prescribed fires have died because of it. And unfortunately, occasionally prescribed fires escape and become wildfires that then therefore endanger people. And that's horrible. And we need to do what we can to make prescribed burning as safe as we can. But we need to have more of it to make us safer and to, to improve the quality of our ecosystems. So how does prescribed burning impact pollinators? This photo is, uh, this photo montage is, is depicting uh, some of the main pollinator groups, butterflies on the upper left, flies in the upper center, moths in the upper right, wasps in the lower left, beetles down here, 
and in the lower right, bees. So how does prescribed burning impact these things? Well, we know prescribed burning can harm bees. It can kill pollinators in any life stage, whether egg, larva, pupa, adult. Uh, a study by Kane and Neff, back in, published in 2011, those folks performed a lab study in Utah showing that heat from prescribed fires was killing some of the ground nesting bees, but only at shallow depths. That was good news. Some bees nest one foot, two feet, three feet underground. Those bees are not harmed by, not harmed directly by fire. The heat of the fire goes up. It doesn't go a foot down. It usually only goes a centimeter or maybe two centimeters down into the soil. Another uh, means in which prescribed burning can harm bees is that it causes the immediate loss of pollen and nectar resources. If you've got a lot of wildflowers out there, blooming shrubs, blooming trees, and you burn those plants down, well, all of a sudden the resources that were there are gone. That's an immediate loss, but usually it's a short-term loss. A longer term loss is that prescribed burning can eliminate stems for stem nesting bees, and it can reduce their abundance for years. Uh, this would be a, particularly an issue with bees that nest in woody stems. If you burned the trees down that, that the bees are nesting in, well, they, they uh, might have a shortage of habitat for a while. And that is, that is a concern. That is something that we need, that the prescribed burners of the world, and I'm one of them, that's something we need to be concerned about. We, we don't want to eliminate habitat for bees. I'm going to focus a little bit on some butterfly examples for the next few minutes, including a species that I studied for many years, the regal fritillary, Speyeria idalia. Actually, now it's our genus idalia. They just changed the name. It's a large butterfly. I think it's one of the most beautiful butterflies in the world, for that matter. It's extremely colorful and classy looking. Um, and it only lives in grasslands, usually in high quality prairie. Uh, you've seen both of these pictures before. The one on the left is Oklahoma. The one on the right is actually Northern Missouri, just south of the Iowa border. These are both excellent spots for regal fritillaries. I have seen regal fritillaries at each of these spots. These are, these are great examples of regal fritillary habitat. Unfortunately, the regal fritillary is in deep trouble. This is a map from the NatureServe program depicting the overall range of the regal fritillary. Now, every state and province that you see colored in has at one time hosted regal fritillaries. The bad news is that all the states and provinces in blue are states from which this species has been eliminated. The states that are in red, the species is extremely rare. Actually, it's considered critically imperiled. The states where it's orange, it's not doing that much better. Um, the only state, according to this analysis by NatureServe, the only state where it was doing really well uh, is Kansas. This species is has declined so much that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is considering listing it as a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. This species was also covered in an initial uh, really formative work by Ann Swengel way back in 1996. And it was this paper uh, that inspired me to research the effects of fire on butterflies way back in 1996. Ann Swengel did most of, well, all of her work in the upper Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, states like that. And what did she find? She found that um, fire was having pretty negative effects on the butterflies that we're looking at. Now, she didn't go out and test, do an experiment to see if fire actually burned up the eggs, larvae, and pupae. That was presumed. If the eggs, larvae, and pupae are above ground, and for most of these species they are, then it is presumed that a fire will incinerate them. These are small creatures, and certainly a fire will burn them up. 
And, and again, her main finding was that the prairies that she looked at fire greatly reduced the abundance of prairie specialist butterflies. Some additional evidence of mortality due to fire, the Arogo skipper, that cute little uh, yellowish butterfly shown on the left, it was extirpated from a national forest in Florida due to a prescribed burn. Extirpated means eliminated. The national forest was a large, big, beautiful, large natural area. It had this rare butterfly and now it doesn't due to a prescribed burn that killed them. Uh, more evidence of this, it seems to be extirpated, the species from the state of Iowa possibly due, to, due to, con, to, to control, better better termed prescribed burning. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody has seen one in years, um, many years, even though they've looked. I spent years looking and I never saw any. Uh, another example, the real fritillary, the large species I showed a few minutes ago, it used to occur in Ohio. The very last population in Ohio was at Rest Haven Wildlife Area and it got eliminated sing, uh, seemingly due to a single fire in one winter. For those of you who are in Minnesota, how are your prairie skippers doing there? Well, the next two slides are from wonderful butterfly and pollinator ecologist, uh, Jessica Peterson. And she sent me these slides. How are they doing? Well, of the 10 species of prairie skippers uh, that are, occur historically in Minnesota, six are gone. Six have been eliminated from the state. And there is reason to believe that fire is one of the main reasons for the disappearance of many of these species in that state. Now I say that knowing that Minnesota needs fire. Minnesota grasslands need fire to state grasslands. They need to be burning more but they also need to be burning carefully. And Minnesota uh, biologists like Jessica Peterson know that. Now, an example from the Southeast, the frosted elfin. Little brown butterfly that I'm gonna show you a picture of a in a moment. And you can see on the left uh, uh, or down in the lower left, I've pasted in the title of a journal article. This journal article is by Dean Jew. Andrew Merwin, Sally Jew, and a couple of other authors um, published uh, not very long ago, I believe just last year. They found 80% decreases in frosted elfin abundance after prescribed fires in open pine forest in the Florida Panhandle. It took three to four years for populations to recover after fire. Now, I'm, I uh, was impressed with this paper when I read it and I was thrilled to see it, um, here's the butterfly, the frosted elfin, a beautiful uh, little thing of the um, eastern half of the US, probably more in the southern, southeastern quarter. I happen to be friends with, Seen, uh, with Sally and Dean Jew. I worked with them 25 years ago. Uh, and this is a picture I took in late March when I visited them at some of their study sites in the Florida Panhandle. And they, uh, got to talk with me. They, uh, they were pleasant enough to talk with me about their research. They showed me the host plant for the frost and elfin in that area, the sundial lupin. They also showed me larvae of the frosted elfin. Now this was in late March. So uh, the, the, the butterflies come out, I believe in early March, they lay eggs and soon after you get larvae eating the sundial lupin. And their research paper concludes that you don't wanna burn then. You don't wanna burn in March, which actually is a common time for people to burn in that region. You don't wanna burn then, because if you do, you'll incinerate the eggs or the larvae. Um, it's better to bloom during the pupal stage later in the year, in the, maybe in midsummer, because some of the pupae do spend time underground. Also, they recommend that people uh, reduce fire frequency. Uh, don't burn every year. If you, if you burn the habitat of the species every year, you'll be killing them every year. If you burn a portion of the habitat each year, you'll be killing some, but the population will remain on the area that's, that is unburned. Now, 
uh, switching way over to the Pacific Northwest, the Marden Skipper, Polites Marden. Here is its distribution from the Seattle area to the Eastern Cascades, to Southwestern Oregon, and uh, a little bit of Northern California. This is a very rare butterfly. The Xerces Society has done a lot of research on this butterfly. And a major paper produced by Scott Black, our executive director, Rich Hatfield, Serena Jepson, and others, a uh, paper produced around 2015, found that the Martin Skipper was harmed a great deal by prescribed burning. Its abundance was much less after a 2008 prescribed burn. So this bar graph, you can see the years that in which they were conducting their study, uh, 2009 to uh, 2012, I believe. And uh, in each year, the abundance of Martin skippers was much higher in unburned habitat than in burned habitat. So I have been giving you lots of reasons why prescribed burning can be harmful to pollinators. And I'll give you one last example of that. And, and that is this species here, the goatweed leafwing. It's a butterfly I took on our farm in Oklahoma. I did not know that we had this butterfly on our farm. I was doing prescribed burn a few years ago in November. And it was a very gentle burn going through the leaf litter at the base of an oak forest on our property. And I looked down and the, the flames were only a few inches tall, but right in front of the flames in the leaves, I could see goatweed leafwing butterflies emerging from the leaf litter and trying to escape the flames. So I learned a few things. A, I learned that we had goatweed leafwings. I learned. B, I learned that goatweed leafwings overwinter as adults in leaf litter. I did not know that. And C, I learned that if you burn in fall or winter, you can, you can be hurting goatweed leafwings. So despite that example and all the previous examples, why do I still burn? This is a fire at our farm that uh, we conducted a few years ago another fire, different day, that we also conducted on our 10-acre farm in Oklahoma. Why do I burn? I burn because there are so many positives to prescribed burning, including for pollinators, that in my opinion, it overcomes the cons. The pros outweigh the cons. Uh, one example of this is my study of regal fritillaries with Sam Fuhlendorf and Dave Engel, published in 2014. We looked at how regal fritillaries and the nectar sources were impacted by time since fire, grazing, and sampling period. We conducted our study at four sites in southwestern Missouri. And this shows our basic study design. On the left, you can see a prairie that was split into three burn units. Something burned this year, something burned last year, something burned two years ago. And on the right, you had a prairie unit, which was burned the exact same way, but it also had cattle. And I'm not going, going to go into the effects of cattle in this talk. That, that could be saved for a different talk. But that's the basic design. And what did we find? We found that regal fritillaries were most abundant in the areas of prairie that had just been burned a few, few months earlier when the time since fire was zero years. Each year after the burn that passed from a burn, the regal fritillaries would get less abundant. Now, why would this be? We hypothesized, and we think the evidence is quite strong, that regal fritillaries increased due to burning, due to increased floral production due to fire. On the left is pale purple coneflower. On the right is tall blazing star. These are both really important nectar sources for regal fritillaries. And they were fantastically abundant 
The photo on the left is taken from a site where there were at least 80,000 flowering stems of the tall blazing star. It was, it was quite a sight to see. Um, and it, the site was full of regal fritillaries and other pollinators. How does fire affect the most famous butterfly, the monarch butterfly? Well, Swengel in her paper in 96 found that monarchs were most abundant in recently burned prairie, which is the opposite of what she had found for regal fritillaries. Uh, in the study I worked on in 2012, we found the same thing in Southern Iowa and nor Northern Missouri, that fire helped to enhance the monarch populations. Leone et al. in 2019 also found this, that monarchs were more abundant in burned prairie. All of these studies involved winter and early spring burns. Where are most monarchs east of the Rockies in winter? Well, that's shown on the photo on the right. They're in Michoacan, Mexico, in the amazing overwintering uh, groves of Oya Melfer. So when you burn monarch habitat in winter and the monarchs aren't there, you're not hurting any monarchs and you're probably in increasing uh, the quality of the habitat. If you burn monarch habitat in summer, you can also be improving the habitat, but you might be causing some mortality of monarchs monarch eggs, larvae, pupae, or even adults. Um, another example of fire effects is a study that I've been working on for years and I, I, I need to be working on this weekend. Dormant season fire, in other words, fire during the winter, increases abundance of butterfly milkweed, which of course uh, is an important host plant for monarch butterflies. Fire also increases the abundance of green antelope green antelope horn milkweed, which is the most important milkweed for monarchs when they fly up from Mexico into Texas and Oklahoma in the early spring. It thrives. Um, all of those plants that you see with yellow green flowers are green antelope horn milkweed. And this prairie in Oklahoma had just been burned a few weeks earlier. And you can see how abundant the plants are. This is phenomenal monarch habitat in large part because it had been burned. And a wonderful study by Kristen Baum, and I believe it's Wyatt Sharber, 2012, they looked at Oklahoma rangeland burned in midsummer, and they found that if you burn the habitat in summer, you cause that milkweed to come back out of dormancy. That plant doesn't like the heat of July, uh, the Oklahoma heat in July and goes dormant, but if you burn it, it'll come back and provide great habitat for monarchs in August and September. And another example of the positives of fire, and I really regret not spending more on time on this, uh, is that ground nesting bees can benefit from fire. And this study was performed by Julia Brokaw and her colleagues. Julia Brokaw is a new coworker of, of mine, Rachel and Carly's. She was just hired by the Xerces Society a few months ago. Uh, and she just finished her PhD studying this and other topics. So we, we have multiple people who work on fire effects and pollinators here at the Xerces Society. Julia and her co-authors found that prescribed fire increases the number of bee nests in tall grass prairie, which is really good. So now for some BMPs. We ask that you burn no more than one third of an area each year, because we want you to minimize direct mortality. That is, the, we, we want you to kill fewer eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults. If you burn an entire large landscape, you're probably gonna cause a lot of mortality, may be so much mortality that the population cannot recover from it. Item number two, pollinators need a refuge to recolonize from. That's why uh, we only want you to burn a portion. If you burn a third of your land, leave the other two thirds as a refuge that's unburned. You can burn them next year. You can, you can burn a third each year perhaps, or perhaps burn a third of your land every two years or every three years. 
But if the whole landscape burns, uh, that's really bad news. If the whole landscape burns every year, that's extremely bad news for our pollinators. Another BMP, best management practice, is to rotate the season of burn. The main idea here is don't burn at the same time every year. Why? Well, burning in the winter can kill native bees. But as I showed you earlier, it's not going to hurt monarchs because monarchs um, burning in the winter in the central and eastern U.S. isn't going to hurt monarchs because they're not here. Burning in April and May might kill monarch caterpillars, but it could be less harmful to bees, which are largely the adult stage flying around. They can fly away from the flames. Burning in late June and early July, as I mentioned, will stimulate green antelope horn milkweed to resprout. And burning in the summer also increases blooming in some flowers. The basic idea here is if you burn at the same time every year, you're going to be benefiting the same species year after year and hurting the other species every time you burn. It's best to switch things around to help even out the effects throughout the pollinator community. However, to get enough fire on the land, we need to be, be prepared to burn at just about any time of year. Uh, here in Oklahoma, there are so many days of the year where you cannot burn just due to weather. It's too rainy, it's too, the humidity is too low, um, it's too hot, things like that. So you, um, for us to get the burning that we need done to improve our ecosystems and to reduce the amount of fuel that's endangering our structures, we need to be ready to burn it just about any month of the year. So where can you get more information on this topic? In the Western US, consider obtaining this document. And uh, Rachel, I, um, I think, has put something in the chat. Um, a, uh, she's probably hopefully put this link in the chat box along with two other links. Um, this is an excellent document produced by colleagues of mine in the Western US. A document that I worked on along with colleagues, Sarah Hamilton Buxton, Ray Powers, and Jennifer Hopwood is this document for the central US on how to manage rangelands in the central US uh, and we talk about grazing, but we also talk about fire. To obtain that document, you can search for rangeland management and pollinators or look in the chat box and uh, uh, there might be a link to this document there. This is a book. You got to buy this one or get it from the library. We don't have a link to that. It's a fantastic book on how to conduct, how to conduct a prescribed burn written by John Weir. I mentioned him earlier. He's a professor at Oklahoma State University. He has conducted more than 1,000 prescribed fires. He hit 1,000 his 1,000th fire, I think four or five years ago. So maybe he's at 1,200 or 1,500 fires by now. I had the great fortune of taking one of his classes in, 20, uh, in 2004 and helped him burn a whole bunch of sites here in Oklahoma. And uh, he's quite the expert. I strongly recommend this book, and I promise I don't receive kickbacks from him. Um, I'm not getting any payments for recommending this fine book on prescribed burning. Who can help you burn your land? It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. All of us need help. I don't want anybody going out there and burning, doing a burn all by yourself. It's too dangerous. Who can help you? Well, the NRCS and its sister organization, the Farm Service Agency, both within the USDA, they can help provide financial assistance and technical assistance for prescribed burning. And this is true in, you know, these agencies are in every state, all 50 states, and our territories as well. So if you are a landowner and you are interested in possibly doing prescribed burning or other conservation practices on your land, please consider getting help from the NRCS and the FSA to do that. 
go to your local USDA service center. And Rachel has placed a link uh, to find your USDA service center in the chat box. Uh, once you're at that, once you find that link and find the address and go to that office, um, you fill out a little form like is shown here on the right. And you might spend five or 10 minutes there filling out this form. Basically, they have to know that you're a landowner and that you have some form of agricultural production uh, that's basically getting you in their system. And they have to verify that, yes, indeed, you own that land. But once you do that, you are eligible for technical and financial assistance. Consider uh, looking for a prescribed burn association for your area. If there isn't one already, consider uh, forming one. The, there are many of these associations in Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, Nebraska. I think they are spreading because they started in Texas. I think then they moved to Oklahoma, uh, but uh, I know they're in Florida now and I suspect uh, they're moving out west as well. Uh, Oklahoma has 24 of these prescribed burn associations. What is a prescribed burn associ association? It's a nonprofit. It's a group of people getting together to help each other out, to help each other burn. Basically, uh, I volunteer to help you burn your land if you volunteer to help me burn my land. And everybody benefits from that because we all need help. Other organizations that can help you if you are part of a tribe, seek assistance for your tribe or from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which does a lot of burning. Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever are in the central and southeastern US. They can help with burning. The Nature Conservancy might be able to help. The US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, has a Partners for Fish and Wildlife program that is uh, very keen on prescribed burning. And perhaps your state's Department of Fish and Game or your state's Department of Wildlife uh, or your state's Department of Conservation has assistance to help you with burning. Just want to let you know about some great uh, other great sources of information. Xerxes Society has its own YouTube channel, and there are lots of great talks posted there. Please connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or now called X, right? Or Instagram um, at Xerxes Society. That's how you connect with us at Xerxes Society. I want to give thanks to NRCS for providing technical and financial assistance for prescribed burning to me and my family uh, to give me more experience with this topic. I very much wanna thank my friends and family for helping me burn. And I want to get people thinking about getting into this. If, you, you've, if you've never done it, try to jo join a prescribed burn association or read up on it, contact an agency and get involved. But then let's teach the next generation. That is uh, my daughter when she was about 17, uh, helping uh, light fires in our land. Yes, it's true. She's not uh, wearing the proper uh, clothing for such, for such work. Um, but uh, I was there. I knew this was a, uh, um, a fire that had very little chance of endangering anybody at any time. Um, and... Uh, um, <laughs> The key is getting people started. Where being safe is also very important too. Most importantly, I need to acknowledge the supporters of the Xerxes Society that help us do our work. I'm happy to say we have many corporate and nonprofit supporters and governmental agencies, but most important, shown in the lower right, are our Xerxes Society members. It really means a lot to us every time a member joins the Xerxes Society. So please consider joining the movement. The work we do depends on everyone. Please make a difference for the invertebrates that you love, that we love, by becoming a member of the Xerxes Society today. To do that, go to xerxes.org slash donate. Almost done here. I want to give a plug for the Xerxes Ambassadors Program. Xerxes, Xerxes Ambassadors are volunteers who help the Xerxes Society carry out its mission. Uh, most commonly in outreach, 
but uh, volunteers can do all kinds of work that they're interested in to, to assist the Xerces Society. Rachel Dunham, our host today, is the manager of the ambassador program. And she will be soliciting, um, she will be recruiting new ambassadors next month. Uh, so if you are interested in possibly volunteering for the Xerces Society as part of this program, um, reach out to Rachel and I think she'll have her contact information in the chat box. Are there any questions, folks? I would love to take your questions. Thank you, Ray. And thank you for the plug about the ambassadors. I just put my email in the chat if anyone is interested in learning more. It is predominantly doing outreach and education. Um, and we'll have more information up on our website in the coming weeks. And we're going to open up the application period next month. So we're excited. Hopefully getting some more folks in the South. We only have a few people down there. So um, we need someone in Oklahoma to keep Ray company. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> We do have a few um, really good questions. So I'm just gonna um, start us off with Bruce. Their question, what is the name of the 40,000 acre preserve that everybody should visit in Oklahoma that you had mentioned? Wonderful question, Bruce. Um, I believe, um, I know I'm getting this name mostly right. I believe it is the Joseph H. Williams Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. I may be getting the middle initial wrong, um, but look for, um, another way to look for it would be uh, the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, Oklahoma. Uh, it is, it is um, wow, maybe the largest, it might be the largest Tallgrass Prairie protected. I think it is the largest protected Tallgrass Prairie left in North America, and it is glorious. It has a herd of uh, close to 3,000 bison. Uh, it also has cattle in, in portions of it. And that's interesting to see. They do research wow. on the effects of cattle grazing on prairie. But uh, the bison unit is, is uh, really amazing. To you drive right through the middle of it and you go okay. slow. Because on the other side of the hill, there might, be a, there might be a herd of bison sitting in the road and you don't want to hit them. So that's a, a glorious place, about an hour, 10 minutes north, northwest of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you. All right, this person is asking if the host plant for the regal fritillary are violets, and if so, are violets found in prairies? They always thought of them in more of the woodland habitat. Yes, I should have mentioned that. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop screen sharing. Uh, yes, you're exactly right. Regal fritillary caterpillars only eat violets. And I grew up in Western New York State, and I associated with violets with forest. It turns out that there are many species of violets in the United States, and many of them occur primarily in prairies. One of them called prairie violet. Uh, another uh, is dog tooth violet, uh, arrow leaf violet. So yes, we have many species of violets in the grasslands of the central U.S. and in grasslands of the eastern U.S. And that's what regal fritillary caterpillars eat. They don't uh, occupy forest. We have other fritillaries that live in the forest and use the violets that grow in the forest. Regal fritillaries don't like forests at all. They have to have prairie. Thank you. All right, Bruce had another maybe kind of comment about the regal fritillary status map that you showed, saying it was from 2003. And they said that last um, Virginia population disappeared at least 10 years ago. And they don't have any known Eastern state currently other than the population um, in Pennsylvania. Yeah, for Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania population. I was fearing that was the case. Bruce, thanks for updating me on that. Ironically, I attended a webinar last week um, in which they said that regal fritillaries are still in Virginia. And I thought to myself, hmm, I thought that maybe they disappeared from Virginia. So thanks for clarifying that for me. That's horrible news. Um, think of it. Think of living in a state 
um, that 60 years ago, 80 years ago, had this really large, showy, beautiful butterfly, and it's not here anymore. Um, my mentor in graduate school was the monarch expert named Dr. Lincoln Brower. He's the world's greatest authority on the monarch. And he grew up in New Jersey, and he remembers uh, catching regal fritillaries in New Jersey as a kid. But they're gone now. They're gone from New Jersey, just barely hanging on in Pennsylvania. Well, I, I think the pop, I, they're managing them well at a military base, so they'll probably last at that, at that base for a long time. Um, but it's amazing to think how they've disappeared from so many, so many states. Thanks, Bruce, for clarifying that one. Great. We're going to go back to the prairie violet question because we're getting more questions about it. So we're going to loop back around and then head back to the previous questions. Kathy's wondering how prairie violets are affected by fire. And Bruce chimed in and asked, don't you need disturbance of the soil by grazing or other means to keep violets in a prairie such as burning? Yeah, wonderful question. I'm embarrassed because I should be, I should have published. I've done work on that and I haven't published it yet. Uh, I conducted a study with help from the wonderful Diane Dubinsky, who was a professor at Iowa State University, in which we planted violets in a prairie from which they had disappeared in Southern Iowa. And then we conducted fires and I helped, I helped light the fires, I helped run the fires, and we had cattle grazing. And the violets did just fine. Uh, they responded. They do great. They, they, the violets almost certainly need fire because if you don't burn the prairie, what happens is after only two or three years without fire and without grazing, if you have no fire, no grazing, no disturbance of any kind, as Bruce pointed out, disturbance is important. If you have no disturbance of any kind, there's a massive buildup of thatch, much worse than what your lawn gets because these prairie grasses, some of them are eight feet tall. Now in wintertime, the snow helps pack them down, but I've been in prairie with thatch that's a foot tall. Um, and the violets can't persist in that, uh, not long-term because it's too shady. There's, there's no sunlight for them to come up when they, try to, when they try to sprout in the spring, there's no sun for them. So, uh, so burning opens things up greatly, the violets. Um, um, a few weeks after, if you do a burn in, in, in March or April, the violets are up uh, like gangbusters just a few weeks later. And grazing, um, the cattle seem not to eat them. So grazing seems to be a positive impact on the violets as well. Um, and uh, I have p-values to demonstrate that, but I apologize that I haven't published it yet. All right, one more question <laughs> about violets. Uh, do introduced violets like field violets, which are native to Europe, but naturalized in the US suffice for the life cycle of a fritillary? For a regal fritillary, it's possible that they do. I have heard of violets. Uh, I don't know which, um, I don't know the scientific name of field violet. I could look it up. Uh, and I will later. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I don't want to try to do a, a, a Google search right now. But I do know that there are very uh, violets in Nebraska, which I think are exotic that regals are using. So yes, I think the answer might end up being yes. Uh, is, is that um, what I do know is that early research suggested that regal fritillaries were very picky that they would only use one or two violet species. More recent research has demonstrated that they will use many or most or maybe all of the violet species that are occurring in Midwestern lands. So they're not as picky as we used to think they are. All right, a couple more questions. Was your control in the regal fritillary study leaving the meadow alone or actually mowing slash cutting back the meadow as opposed to fire? Does mowing, cutting, grazing back area promote similar fritillary abundance when compared to fire? The, we had no, we had no control in which, control unit in which nothing was done. 
And, and part of the reason for that is these studies are conducted on nature preserves. I think all of them were conducted on nature, nature preserves owned by the Missouri Department of Conservation. And they already know that if you don't do anything, the trees will take over and they don't want that. Um, so they know you need to serve in some form, mowing or gra um, mowing, grazing or burning. Grazing alone won't keep the woody plants from taking over because the, the, the livestock tend not to eat woody plants. Rachel, could you repeat the second part of that question? <laughs> or is it gone? It's not gone, I'll find it. <laughs> um, does mowing, cutting, or grazing back area promote similar fritillary abundance compared to what was treated with fire? Phenomenal question. Um, the early research by Ann Swengel, uh, I think her paper in 1998 and papers in 2000, 2001, suggested that mowing or haying, cutting, cutting, now mowing is just you know, cutting prairie and letting it sit. Haying is you cut the prairie and then you take it off site and, and sell it or give it to your, your own livestock as feed. Um, she found that haying was better than fire. Now, my results were very different from hers, right? Anne uh, said that fire was bad for regal fritillaries. I told you today that my study said fire is good for regal fritillaries. And I think the main difference for that is the landscape context of our two studies were very different. And I've discussed this with Anne over the telephone. Um, she worked in the upper Midwest in areas where the prairies are a lot smaller. And often they're so small that often the managers just burn the whole thing. Um, let's say you've got a 40 acre prairie in Iowa and it's surrounded on all sides by corn. Well, that 40 acre prairie might have regal fritillaries in it. If you burn the entire thing one January, you could wipe out the regal fritillaries. You probably will. My study, was conducted much further south in Missouri, where there was a lot of other prairie nearby that was unburned. Uh, and, and again, we only burned a portion so that when you burn a portion of the prairie, you're probably killing regal fritillaries where you did the burn, but they're flying in from the unburned uh, areas nearby, attracted by the huge wow. abundance of flowers that you've just stimulated by conducting that burn. I hope that addressed the yeah. initial question. Well, yeah. 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 All right, a couple more questions. So Lindsay wants to know, is there a minimum maximum size of habitat unit that you could be used instead of one third of the area, assuming you are coordinating with your neighbors for burning? A, a minimum, oh, that's a really tough question. I, I think she's asking, is there a minimum area of habitat that would be used by the pollinators? Is that your interpretation of it, Rachel? Could, do you still have it? I do. I'm trying to think. Um, I oh, think I specifying the area is um, minimum, maximum. Maybe her property is. I get it. It's a minimum, maximum size of area that should be burned. Um, I don't think that's been worked out yet in research. What I will say is my, my, my thought, it's not even a theory, but my thought is that as you get to bigger and bigger, bigger landscapes, if you're still burning a third of a truly colossal landscape, that might be more problematic for the pollinators to recover from because Let's say you have a uh, 30,000 acre ranch. And I've been, on, I've been on ranches in Oklahoma that are bigger than that. You have a 30,000 acre ranch and you burn 10,000 acres this year. Um, let's say you wipe out a whole bunch of fire sensitive pollinators from that 10,000 acres. That's a huge, 10,000 acres is you know, miles by miles. 
maybe it's going to take a long time for the pollinators in the habitat that didn't get burned. Maybe it'll take a long time for them to colonize, to, to fly miles to recolonize that unburned site. So I, I get a little worried with, with the effects of really large burns on pollinators. But in smaller sites, um, in, in general, I haven't looked. Um, in general, I don't have an answer for you, <laughs> Lindsay. Um, I, I, I tend to go for percentages rather than acreages. But I would say at larger acreages, I would try to back off from the 33% if you can. On the other hand, if we don't have enough burning in a 30,000 acre ranch in Oklahoma and Texas, um, but again, the same issue applies in, in other regions of the country. If we don't have enough burning, the trees will come back and, and eliminate the grassland. Any others? Yes, uh, Jackson is wondering, they recently read Alan Savory's holistic management book and he seems to be against prescribed fire, even when done responsibly, responsibly because it can be hard to quantify total animal insect loss as well as contributing to GHG emissions. Do you have any comments on that perspective? Because it, it, uh, Dr. Savory, uh, let's see, hard to quantify total animal insect loss. I don't think it's hard to, that hard to quantify. Um, you know, we, 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 Dr. Savory doesn't actually do research on this topic. Um, I don't think he counts pollinators at all. Um, on, on the other hand, um, there's plenty of research papers suggesting from people who did go out and actually measure pollinator populations that show that the improvements to the habitat based on due to burning did increase pollinator populations. So, so um, Dr. Savory is uh, more of a theorist rather than a uh, an empiricist, I think is fair to say, um, and uh, is not an expert on pollinators. Good answer. <laughs> All right, uh, one more question, and then I have the scientific name for the field violet for you. Two of our audience members um, gave it to us, so I'll keep you on the edge of your seat <laughs> for this next question from Kathy. Uh, I was wondering specifically in your presentation, the photo after burning cedar, was that overseeded or natural from a seed bank? Um, I know what photo you're talking about. Um, it would probably, um, yeah, I showed cedars. First, I showed slides of my land showing cedars and how awful it was when there were so many cedars. And then I switched to a, side, uh, a slide from Southern Oklahoma with lots of wildflowers. The answer to that was these people did not have to plant anything. In their case, the seeds were all in the seed bank. Now that's not quite as true for the farm that my wife and I live on. So we have added wildflower seeds after we've burned, after we've cut down cedars, we have supplemented uh, the seed bank. Because what was in the seed bank? There were a lot of weeds because we live closer to town. There was a lot of junk, a lot of stuff that you, a lot of uh, invasive exotic plants that are highly problematic. Um, so we had to add good stuff. But yeah, that site in Southern Oklahoma, they didn't plant anything. It was all already in the seed bank. And that's going to be true for many regions. Uh, Florida, North Florida, um, I work there. So many of the sites um, have very few exotic plants. South Florida, you know, near Miami, that's tropical. That's different. They're, they're loaded with plants from all over the tropics, but but North Florida and much of the Southeast um, would 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 uh, also, if you do a burn, you have lots of great things come up from the seed bank. Great question. All right, the scientific name. I hope I don't butcher this. Luckily, it's not a hard one, um, but it's Viola arvensis. I have not heard that. Uh, um, I've heard the term arvensis before. Uh, I haven't heard of viola arvensis um, in reference to regal fritillaries. So I'm going to look that up. That's another thing to Google search. 
to see if that's ever been recorded as a as a host plant. The the one I remember hearing about is a difficult one to pronounce, Viola Rathaneskii, named yeah. after presumably somebody named Rathanesk. And um, I think it's exotic. I think it's from Europe and 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 made its way to Nebraska, but it might be native. I don't know. But I remember the person who's quite an expert, a uh, fellow named Chris, Hel Chris Helzer, um, he's a, the head of science for the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska, uh, said that regal fritillaries were using that species and he was surprised because it's such a weed, it's weedy species, as opposed to one of the sort of high quality prairie species. So uh, thanks for letting me know. Uh, I will look into Viola Arvensis, good question. All right, we actually have one more question and then we'll end. Uh, great questions today though to our audience. It's Bruce, thank you Bruce for contributing so many great questions. Uh, Bruce is wondering what about other pollinator species like flower flies? How do they react as a population to prescribed burns? I, I have done no research on flower flies and I haven't seen, I haven't read much. Uh, as you can see from my presentation, now my, my presentation focused probably a little bit too much on butterflies. It's because I'm a butterfly researcher. Uh, I've only done a tiny bit of research on bees, uh, but most of the literature on this topic has been on the effects of fire on butterflies and the effects of fire on bees. Now there are studies out there, I believe that look at other taxa, but I apologize. Um, I cannot remember any findings at this moment on the effects of fire on flower flies. Um, you might know more about flower flies than I do. I certainly don't know much about them. The, the key is to think of the life cycle and to think of, of how, what stage of the life cycle is the organism, the organism at when, when a fire is conducted. Um, if you're in a region where most people burn in middle of winter and your organism is an egg larva or pupa or adult that hangs out above ground, it's probably gonna get burned up. If on the other hand, your organism is migratory and spends the winter in Venezuela, then obviously the fire is not gonna impact it. If you fire, if you burn in the summer, um, there's a chance that your species is in the adult form and the adult form is pretty much always more capable of escaping fire than any of the, the immature phases. So uh, that's why burning in summer, one, one of many reasons why burning in summer can be, uh, can be advantageous for pollinators. I've done some summer burns in uh, 105 degree temperatures and, and it was not pleasant, but um, it was awful actually. <laughs> But we we it was important work, but uh, it it was it is pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds pretty awful. <laughs> I can't imagine it was like 105 yesterday here in Missoula, and I would not be want to be on a prescribed burn. So sorry, I heard about this horrible record-setting heat wave you're getting. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of unfortunately wildfires here as well. Um, all right, so one just more technical question, if it's okay for me to share your email address. Kathy is wondering if she can contact you. She has a specific land management question on a smaller uh, property. I, you, everybody here is free to email me, please. Yeah, there's my email address in the chat box. I am, I am here to serve, here to serve you, here to answer any questions, uh, discuss stuff with you. Yes. Well, 